Chapter 5 Aki Back in the barn with his dragon, Jackin repeated the name out loud and was rewarded by a faint fluttering gold image. Heartsblood was still fast asleep, but Jackin's reaction to Aki's name had got through to her. Aki. Jackin sat close to the dragon and put his hand on her flank. Her scales were cool to the touch. He ran his hand carefully down her leg, feeling the jagged edge of a long, zigzagging scar, one of the legacies of her pit fights. For a full year, he'd schooled himself not to think of Aki, Sarkhan's dark-haired daughter. He'd thrown himself into his work at the farm, training heart's blood with the dedication the others had marveled at. And for most of the time, he'd forgotten Aki, or at least not remembered her. But now the memories came flooding back. Aki. The last time he'd seen her, they had kissed, and they had quarreled. The kiss had been her doing. He'd been too much in awe of her to try. She'd knelt beside him and taken his head in her hands, her palms as hot as dragon's blood burning his cheeks. She'd leaned over and touched her lips to his. And then, before he could tell her how he really felt, she'd gone away, spurred on by some unnamed mission of her own and by his own clumsiness. He hadn't followed her because he hadn't known where she was going or if she wanted him to come. And besides, he'd had a dragon to train and a life to build. And now, more than a year later, this stranger, this unnatural, scentless, ship-born senator, came with Aki's name in his mouth and a strange story of what she'd been doing in the intervening seasons. Aki, Golden claimed, had been living and working in the rope in a baggery. Not a baggery! Sarkhan had boomed out. Jackin's denial had been just a moment behind. They both knew it was the easiest and best-paying job for a young, good-looking girl, and there was no shame attached to it. But Sarkhan's daughter hadn't needed to earn money. She was no bonder. Sarkhan would have given her anything she wanted, he said. At that, Jackin had laughed, remembering how emphatically Aki had wanted to do things on her own. I fill my bag with no man's gold, she'd said last year, refusing payment from Sarkhan for her role in helping Jackin kill a drac. But baggery girls took money from men, all kinds of men. It was that darker image that horrified Jackin. What if some other man... Some bonder as blood-scored and smelling of blisterweed as old Lacarn, or some starship trooper, scentless and bloodless, had been buying her kisses at the baggery. Not a baggery, he had said aloud again. Ah, the doctor's assistant, Golden answered, a strange smile playing around his mouth. She's quite a midwife by now. Jackin couldn't fully explain the relief and embarrassment he'd felt then. How could he have misjudged Aki when he knew she'd always wanted to be a doctor? And was it his business anyway, if she wanted to sell or give her kisses away? He had started to say something else when Golden spoke again. But she disappeared. Disappeared, Sarkin interrupted. What do you mean? She has often gone off by herself. No one keeps an eye on her. When she was needed, she was always there. But essentially, she has always been a loner. Sarkin smiled heavily. She's my daughter, all right. The fact is, no one knew she was your daughter. She wore a bag, so it was assumed she was a bonder. A runaway from a nursery, perhaps. Or an escapee from a baggery in one of the smaller cities. Sarkhan looked at him. And you didn't turn her in, you, the lawmaker. Golden pulled the slow smile across his face again, a now familiar gesture. There are laws, and laws. She was a fine doctor's assistant, even if she was a bonder, was what we all thought, and she was useful. An empty bag, Jackin said suddenly. She wore an empty bag. She said it helped remind her. Just so, Golden said smoothly. That is what we finally figured out after she had disappeared. But we still thought we were dealing with an independent-minded bonder, a hard-working loner. It was quite a while before we discovered she was gone. Most of the bad girls had shrugged it off. No one had mentioned that she hadn't been around for days. So what if another young blonde girl disappears? It happens all the time. There are underground baggeries that serve the rebels, staffed with young runaways. Everyone knows about that. And some of the girls, it is rumored, are shipped off world though we have no evidence of that. The Federation would have to be called in if such a thing were true. But the doctor Aki worked for noticed her absence and mentioned it to me because she knew I had taken a liking to the girl. And then a note came, a note that said, 
Ask Jack and Stuart at my father's nursery. Are you a man yet? If so, I need you. The bond record showed Jack and was here. So here I am to ask him that very question. Sarkhan blustered. A man? Of course he's a man. A fine trader. A young master. Just look at him. What kind of question is that? Jackin felt his face flush, and he turned away to stare out the window. The first of the twin moons had risen. Sand-colored, slightly egg-shaped, it was beginning its passage across the sky. Uh, uh, I need to think about what she means. Jackin stuttered, though his heart was thundering madly, and he had a sweet sour taste in his mouth. I need to think what all this means. Then he had walked out of Sarkhan's house with the nursery owner calling after him. What do you mean? Think about it. Humans, boy. Of course you're going, and I'm going with you. The heavy door had swung shut on the rest of Sarkhan's tirade, as Jackin had walked purposefully into the night. Sarkhan was right about one thing. Of course, he was going. But everything else was a blur. His mind kept repeating Aki's name over and over, almost like a chant. Before he realized it, he found himself sitting by the sleeping dragon in the heat of the incubarn, not even aware that he had missed his dinner. Aki. It had been well over a year since he had any word of her, and now she needed him. Her face once reduced to a blurred outline in his mind, sprang sharply into focus. The straight black hair, the cream-colored skin, the generous, mobile, mocking mouth. Happy. He would have to puzzle out her cryptic message, then arrange things here at the nursery. Whether he was by his dragon's side or not, her eggs would be hatching in a day or two. If they hatched without him, his chance to imprint the new worms would be gone. Oh, he would still be able to reach their minds, but not with the unique closeness he developed with heart's blood. And did he dare trust them to Erekin's care? Still, Aki's safety was the most important thing. The dragon stirred uneasily at his thought, and a soft gray sending lanced with black came into his mind. I'm sorry, beauty. Thou art first, and thy hatchlings. But he knew he lied, and the dragon knew too, for the gray landscape broke into pieces like storm clouds and drifted away. Jackin stood and stretched, patting heart's blood on the flank. The message, he had to think about it. What had she meant when she asked if he was a man? Her final words to him after their quarrel had been about that. For a year, he had pushed the scene from his mind, banished it, but now it returned to embarrass him. It had begun as teasing. He had said, You can't leave the nursery. You belong here with me. Your father gave you to me. He said you were too strong-willed for a woman, that you needed a master. But he had said it laughingly, because one of the things he liked about her was her forwardness, her ability to speak her mind. And after all, it was she who had kissed him. But somehow what he said had angered her beyond believing. She'd stood up and, nearly shaking, said, You are such a boy, such a child, Jack and Stuart, and so is my father. Talk to me when you are a man. Then she had run off across the sand and disappeared, apparently into the rope and a baggery, as Senator Golden was to be believed. And now Golden had come bearing a message from her, a message that no one but Jackin and Aki could have deciphered. But where was she? Why did she need him? Why had she sent the message through Golden? How well did she really know him? And what did the message really mean? Jackin knew he was as strong as any man on the farm, strong from carting dust and fumes, from handling the stud dragons, from working out with the fighters in their training sessions by holding the heavy, steel-tipped wands. He'd fought a drac, trained and run a dex act, a ten-time winner in the pits. But none of those answers would have satisfied Aki last year, and he guessed none would satisfy her now. Are you a man yet? The only honest answer he could give was that he really didn't know. But the end of the message had been, I need you. So he'd go. And the rest would happen as it must. He believed that, believed in the inevitability of consequence. Just as the fertile eggs in a pyramid would hatch if you didn't disturb them. Jack and walked over to the pile of eggs. He touched the top one with his finger hard enough to punch a hole in its shell. The egg slid down the pyramid, leaking a viscous liquid. When it reached the floor, it broke open. Inside was a yellow slime with no hint of a growing dragon inside. If left alone, the fertile eggs in the pyramid would hatch. First, they would harden, their elastic shells becoming so strong almost nothing could break them open from the outside. Only the hatchling within could break the shell when it was time, using a horny growth on its nose. Jackin looked again at the sleeping dragon and at the clutch of eggs. He touched the broken egg on the floor with his foot. No one would do that to him. He'd let no one break his life open. He'd do what had to be done and emerge from this thing intact. Jackie. He promised himself he'd find her, and he prided himself on keeping his promises.